Jerome Powell, the governor of the Federal Reserve Bank in the United States, gave his much anticipated speech coming out of the Jackson Hole Wyoming Symposium that is held annually among central bankers in the US. And in that speech, he finally indicated that the Federal Reserve in the US is ready to start tapering their bond buying program. But he also was explicit in saying that that doesn't necessarily mean that they are ready to start increasing interest rates. In fact, he indicated that interest rates could be increased less often as more and more jobs are added to the economy. And today what we're going to do is we're going to discuss what that means for Canada and what it means for you and your mortgage borrowing program going forward and the types of borrowing decisions you should be making in anticipation of the future of what interest rates are going to look like in North America. But before we get into it, do me that favor, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, please hit that like button so more people like you can see this video. And don't forget about our race to 25,000 subscribers where one lucky subscriber is going to win $5,000 to put towards their savings, their investments, pay down their mortgage, maybe put towards a down payment or simply do with whatever they like. But you have to be subscribed to win. Huge thank you to the 16,000 of you, almost 17,000 of you now that are already subscribed. I appreciate each and every one of you. If you aren't already subscribed, go ahead, click that subscribe button. It's free, it's easy, and it's definitely worth it. The definitive guide on how to manage your credit, product, penalty, price in that order. It's never been more important to get your mortgage right. Okay, so let's get into it. Let's discuss Jerome Powell, the Federal Reserve Bank, what it means to Canada, all the things with respect to your mortgage borrowing strategy going forward, because I think this one is going to surprise you with respect to the strategy that I'm going to suggest at the end. And here's the reality of it, okay? The Bank of Canada was one of the first banks in North America, sorry, not in North America, in the world to start their bond tapering program and start buying less bonds. That has a lot to do with the strength of the Canadian economy. It has to do with some forward thinking from the Canadian Central Bank, but it also is naive of us to think that we aren't closely tied to what happens in the US. They're our single big, biggest trading partner. And what the US does has a huge impact on what the Canadian Central Bank can do. So this is why we're watching this topic closely. And this is why today we're talking about Jerome Powell and his conversation coming out of the Jackson Hole, Wyoming annual retreat for the central bankers in the US and the conversation that they are having going forward and the things that they're indicating. And I'm going to make some pretty interesting, uh, interesting connections here for you. And whether I'm right or wrong, who knows, as an economist, I know that any future forward looking predictions are very hard to make. Economists are really good at making judgment in hindsight, but not so much looking into the future. But I am definitely going to discuss what I think the strategy is going forward based on what Jerome Powell is saying in this speech and the information that we have today. So first and foremost, here's the article out of CNBC. Of course, this was covered by the Canadian media as well. Uh, the headline is this. Powell sees taper by the end of the year, but says there's much ground to cover before rate hikes. So what he is saying is much like what Canada did a few months ago, which was starting to taper bond buying programs. They are considering doing the same likely by the end of the year. Now, what bond buying programs are, for those of you who haven't been following along for very long, is that is another tool that central banks have other than lowering interest rates in order to inject money into the economy. So they buy bonds from the government, they buy mortgage backed securities, and that injects further cash into the economy, which has a similar effect to lowering interest rates. So when the pandemic hit, obviously central banks started doing a significant amount of bond buying and that helped out the economy significantly. And what they have to do in order to get to the point where they can start raising interest rates is they have to taper back that bond buying first. They have to take that stimulus out of the economy before they can start increasing interest rates and taking the low interest rate stimulus out of the economy. And by the way, they've done this before, going back to the financial crisis in 2008 in 2009. Similar program happened in 2013. The Federal Reserve surprised everybody and started tapering their bond buying programs. And then that led to several rate increases. This time around, they're going, hey, hold on a second. We're not going to surprise the economy. We are going to do this in a very well communicated format and make sure that everyone knows exactly what's going on. And one of the key things that I wanted to point out in this article is down here around the bottom, 
they talk about unemployment rates. And this is the big thing for the for the Federal Reserve is they are not only paying attention to inflation, they have a dual mandate to also pay attention to jobs. So in other words, rather than just increasing interest rates and then subsequently lowering inflation and perhaps affecting the lower income uh, members of society, what their job is is to make sure that the people that are on the lower income bracket are employed before they start making big changes to interest rates. Because if you increase interest rates, that reduces borrowing, has a potential negative impact on jobs, which, which hurts the sector of the economy that is not as easily employed and is not as wealthy. And what it does is an, an early increase in interest rates creates a bigger gap in the wealth distribution and in the economy as a whole. So he's talking about unemployment here. Uh, in April of 2020, it was 14.8%. In July, it was 5.4%. So they've made significant progress. But what they're aiming for is they're aiming towards full employment, which in their mind is similar employment to what was there in February of 2020, which was 3.5%. So that's the first thing that they're aiming for. They're aiming for full employment, which means you're going to see a pretty significant amount of time before they start increasing interest rates because they need to get those people who are not as employable back to work so that subsequent increases in interest rates aren't going to have a, a catastrophic negative effect on that part of society. So then if we go and we take a look moving on to the Canadian media, there's a couple of things that the Canadian media covered that the US media didn't cover. Uh, obviously, BNN's coverage on this is a little bit more centered towards the interest rate policy than it is the employment policy. But at, again, at the bottom of this article, they make a really interesting point. And that is this one right here highlighted in black. And that is that the new framework dictates that the Fed officials allow economic expansion to progress further than they have in the past before raising interest rates to drive unemployment rates down faster and allow low income groups to share in the benefits from a strong economy. Now, this is in reference to a change that was made a couple of years ago with respect to how the Federal Reserve Bank operates. And they now operate in a dual mandate. Again, like I said, inflation and employment. And it you're going to see longer periods between interest rate increases in order to protect employment. So that's going to have an impact on how we choose our mortgages and how we are borrowing. Now, one thing I want to point out as well is that in Canada right now, at, after the election in the fall, the Bank of Canada is renewing its mandate. They do this every five years with the federal government. And in the past, they have had a single mandate, which is inflation. And what the Bank of Canada is looking to right now is moving towards a similar process to what the Federal Reserve Bank in the US has, which is a dual mandate, which means they will also be focusing on employment. So they aren't only focusing on inflation. In fact, both the Federal Reserve Bank in the US and the Bank of Canada are basically stating that they're going to allow inflation to run hot in order to create more jobs and allow people to get back to work before they do things like increase interest rates and create a, I guess, what could be a catastrophic um, personal impact on those low income individuals. So what this all means is over the long term, we're going to see longer periods before they increase interest rates. Now, in the past 10, 15 years, we've seen very few interest rate increases. Just before the pandemic, we were getting up to around three and a half percent. It took about 10 years for us to get from about 2% to three and a half percent with respect to what mortgage rates were. And then obviously at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw them come crashing back down. What you can probably expect is that it's going to take longer for interest rates to increase going forward. It might take 15 to 20 years this time around because the Bank of Canada, Federal Reserve Bank in the US have been very clear in the fact that they are going to allow interest rates to stay low while employment comes back up to speed. And if the Bank of Canada introduces a dual mandate, you can rest assured that it's going to take longer between interest rate increases. Now, what that may mean is it may mean that the Bank of Canada and the Federal Reserve Bank are going to have to use bigger hammers when it comes time to increase interest rates. So instead of doing it by 0.25%, they might do it by half a percent. Or rather than that, they might do multiple increases in succession, so over a six month period. But at the end of the day, you're going to see longer waits between those increases. And what longer waits means is that normal aspects of the economy could come into play and lower 
economic production before they get around to actually increasing interest rates, which could lead to even longer uh, times between increased interest rates. So what that means for a mortgage consumer is that the long-term fixed rates play, rate plays, the five-year and the 10-year rate plays, are less attractive than they were. In fact, I can't in good, any good conscience recommend to anybody a 10-year fixed mortgage. We just know that over time, even when they are at the lowest rates they've been in history, generally lose. And we saw that back in 2010, 2011, people were taking 3.5% 10-year mortgages when they could get five-year mortgages at 2.5%. And those people at the end of five years all ended up refinancing. Every single 10-year mortgage that we did, they ended up refinancing because they could get a lower rate five years later than when it initially started. And you have to think pandemic versus financial crisis in 2008, 2009, they were pretty similar types of crisis from the perspective of the economy. And at the end of the day, five years later, people were still getting lower five-year fix than the 10-year fixed rates. And I think that's probably gonna hold true this time around as well. So what that means for borrowers and what we're recommending is we're recommending shorter term mortgages. Now, a variable rate mortgage is the shortest term type of mortgage, even though it comes with a five-year term and a five-year discount. The interest rates on a five-year mortgage are essentially the shortest type of term you can get. We're also looking at one and two-year mortgages. But the big thing here is if you're looking at a variable rate mortgage right now at 1.45% versus a 10-year fixed at 2.79 on a $500,000 mortgage, that is a $35,000, actually it's a $37,000 difference between those two interest rates over the first five years. A five-year fixed versus a variable right now at half a percent, that is about a $2,500 difference per year, which over five years is about $12,500. So we're a big believer in locking in, but we're a big believer in locking in savings by taking variable rates and short-term rates while we watch the Bank of Canada and the Federal Reserve Bank in the US figure out what the heck they're going to do with interest rates. And right now, the best information we have is that if interest rate increases are a while down the road, at least a year. By the time we get to a year down the road, the story could change and we could be at another year down the road before they're looking at interest rate increases. Or we could just be looking at very small interest rate increases, but we don't know. So the opportunity right now at this exact moment is to take a variable rate or short-term mortgage, save as much money as we possibly can at this moment and then watch and see what the Fed does. And if we need to lock in, we lock in. If we can get better variable rates or it doesn't look like rates are gonna go up much, we stick with the short-term strategy. But as far as what we know right now, everything is showing us that we should be sticking to that short-term strategy and saving as much money, put as, putting as much money into our pockets, our savings, our investments, or to paying down our mortgage as possible while we can, while interest rates are low, and then we'll figure out the rest when we have better information. If you're looking at getting into the real estate market, if you're looking at getting a mortgage, if you're looking at implementing a mortgage strategy, we of course would love to help you at Mortgage360. If for whatever reason, you've got maybe a relative, a friend, a family member who's in banking, in mortgage brokering, and you feel obligated to use them, or you just have somebody that you wanna use, I'm a big believer in people having perfect information. So for that reason, we've put together a course called Secrets to Getting the Lowest Interest Rate. It is a very short course, very, very inexpensive. It will get you at least 10 to 50 times your money back by just knowing what's available out there for interest rates and knowing how to negotiate your interest rates and how much you can negotiate them. And I've put a special uh, special offer from Mortgage360 in that course if you decide to take it to guarantee that you will get at least 10 times your money back should you choose Mortgage360 for your mortgage after taking that course. Again, priced really, really low. Link in the description below with a 50% off coupon off the already discounted price. I sincerely hope that you will join us in that course because my big thing is making sure everybody has the same information that Mortgage360 clients have so that they can be among the most informed borrowers in Canada. And and even if you don't take that course, if you found this video useful, do me that favor, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, hit that like button so more people like you can see this video. Don't forget about that race to 25,000 subscribers and we'll see you on the very next one. Cheers.